You're listening to Win Win, an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf. And welcome to the Win Win Podcast. This is your host, as always, Ben Wolf. We're going to be learning from our guest today how to mature your metrics, which is a little alliterative as any good title should be. So I would ask you at this point to pause this podcast, stop leave a review, like, comment, share, follow, whatever it is that you are allowed to do on the platform on which you are listening to or watching this. That's going to help make the content that we're sharing here, the information, the tools, the knowledge accessible to more people uh, based on the the algorithms of our uh, our uh, our uh, technology overlords uh, will give this information to more people. So please do pause, like, leave a review, follow, and uh, that would be very meaningful. So with that, I want to get into introducing our guest today, who is the president of the fractional sales leadership firm, Convergo. Uh, You can find out more about him and that business at convergo.co, C-O-N-V-R-G-O dot C-O. And with that, I give you Bill Poole. Bill, it's good to see you today. Thank you so much. for. I'm really excited for uh, sitting in on your podcast today. (laughs) The uh, I really appreciate it. It's great to see you. It was great to meet you a few weeks ago at the uh, at the conference, and uh, and and find out that you are, are are much taller than you look on Zoom. So I'm glad you went back to your old <laughs> height uh, that I, I usually know you as. Uh, but you know, so as, before we get into this topic of uh, of of maturing your metrics, uh, let me ask you to please first uh, give us a quick two minute background into kind of yourself, your journey, and how we got to be talking about something like this today. Of course, Ben. And my journey is interesting. Actually, journey is a, a term we use a lot here at Convergo. Uh, my journey, uh, I sold technology out of college, uh, which was uh, very fun. I've always always enjoyed always enjoyed sales. Had a variety of different positions um, in, you know, from just a regular uh, cold calling rep at first to, you know, managing a dealership. Wait, you're saying you training. enjoyed cold calling? Is that is that what I heard you just say? At that part, you know, you had to pay your dues. You had to pay okay. your dues. Ben, I, frankly, correct. I did not enjoy cold calling, but I do enjoy sales because I'm a people person. So, thanks for calling me out, Ben. No, I appreciate I, it. I just, I, I there could be people out there. There could be someone of this rare breed, and I want to meet them. So. You know what? There are. I think that there are. I'm, I'm personally not one of them, but I, I do believe that they're out there. So I had a great experience there doing all the different things that I did, but I, and I got into some sales training and went out on my own to do sales training as well. And I was working a lot for um, a fortune 500 company or two doing contract sales training, which was really fun and rewarding, but it was a little frustrating um, after doing it for a while, realizing the experience that the, you know, what was happening to the reps after the training, when they went back in the field really wasn't the reality, you know, the concepts that we were delivering wasn't the reality of what, how they were supported and, and directed when they got into the feed back into the field. So I, um, I I was engaged in a, a project to transform like product selling reps into services uh, to help enable them to sell services. And it really helped me understand some of the things that were missing there, Ben, um, you know, to have that structure and leadership and consistency across the sales organization was really what was missing with some of those earlier engagements where I was just doing contract sales training. Mm-hmm. Um on that project, I met my mentor though, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Dalton does still does work for me. Um, she, um, we worked on, we shifted gears and started um, looking at um, smaller, entre- more entrepreneurial organizations where we could really make an impact. And at that point, I really enjoyed. I realized how much I enjoyed making a difference for you know in the entrepreneur space and helping helping entrepreneurs that were struggling with stuff I could help with. So, really, my career was really transformed. Uh, with that project then. Right. Very so, cool. So let's, here we are. Yeah, here we are. And let me, let me dive into the, the topic today, which is, you know, this concept of maturing your metrics, uh, something you talk a lot about on your website and Convergo's website. Um, what does that mean? What does maturing your metrics mean? What, what you know, what, what is the, uh, you know, how does mature metrics exemplify or show up versus immature metrics? If we could use that term, what does that mean? Yep. Sure. So really having scorecard success is about two things. First, it's about tracking the right metrics and then it's really, and then taking the right actions. And I say tracking the right metrics first, because it's really hard to take the right actions. 
if you're not tracking the right metrics. And I know it's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg scenario, but a mature scorecard is the scorecard where you're you're tracking the right metrics and really you're the you know the the idea is that you've got your your goals on your VTO or business plan at the top you know at the top you've got some some lagging metrics that would support that business plan and then if you go all the way down to the bottom in the sales scorecard area that's you have the activity metrics you want to ensure that the activity metrics at the ground level are doing are the right activity metrics that are going to lead to those lagging results. So the idea is that you have a connected scorecard, like the activity metrics. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can walk up the activity metrics, then support some leading metrics, which get closer and closer to the to the um, to the lagging metrics. So it's if they're disconnected, then you know if you're not, if the activity metrics are not connected up to the uh, up to the top, you know the top line metrics on the business plan or VTO, then it's challenging. So the mature scorecard, you know, it's really a journey. The whole scorecard then is um, you have to start on the journey, but I've never seen a, a, an organization or a person that started with a scorecard that was mature because you have right. to try things, implement systems, uh, watch how the metrics work, um, figure out what you're doing wrong. And then when you, when this, and, and there's never a perfect scorecard, you know, you're, it's kind of a, that's why it's a journey that's really never ending. You're, your scorecard is is um, always improving, um, but when that scorecard is mature and you're you're tracking really good metrics, it really enables you then to take the right actions. So the mature scorecard is the one that really works for you. If you don't, if you're not tracking the right metrics, then it becomes challenging to know you know what action to take to improve things. Right. Well, tell me a story. I mean, it's easier for people, I think, to see themselves in uh, in something when they you know when you could paint a picture that's somewhat concrete and they could relate to. I mean, tell me a story of an immature scorecard. Okay. Um, immature scorecard. This one wasn't incredibly immature. It was, it was, a, it was a teenager then. Okay. So uh, <laughs> adolescent maybe. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I was working with a cybersecurity firm that um, was stuck at about 4 million um, that, you know, IT work, especially in that space, is a really a high trust situation. Um, and I was working with the team there, looked at the, the sales scorecard, and they were tracking things like proposals and close rates. They really knew their close rates for different types of opportunities that they were pursuing. And they were that's a really tight metrics in place, but it wasn't totally connected. Try a proposal, while it sounds like an activity metric, it's really a leading metric because there's some activities that are going to lead to that that proposal being generated. We see it a lot, and this particular company was not tracking any activity metrics. So nothing before the proposal stage. Exactly. Right. I, I think they had, they had, um, if I recall correctly, they had demos, um, and even, um, and even meetings. Um, but they really, you know, meetings. Um, you don't. You have to put activities in to get a meeting, right? You need best to start with the activities that are going to get you the meetings, regardless of what, what the activities are. You know, in the SaaS space, you see like cold calling, you know, reps doing outbound cold calling. So it doesn't really work as well for professional services organizations. A lot of them sell through strategic partners and such, but you have to have a process in place um, with activity, the activity metrics that are going to drive, that are going to support you the way you want those reps to sell. Um, so, um, so we helped them develop some systems. Um, and it's kind of, I said chicken and egg before, so you help them develop, develop some systems to improve you know, to get more meetings and really, you know, then at that point you're tracking the activity metrics that are going to get you the meetings, the meetings that are convert to demos, the demos that convert to proposals, and then, and then the proposals that convert to um, ideal clients. So that's an example of a connected scorecard. And then right. we implemented the metrics from that system onto the scorecard and they're off and running and um, now able to take appropriate action when they meet with their, in their, they run on EOS and, and, um, in their level tens, they're able to take the appropriate action. Right, and I, presumably, when it's connected in that way, you could understand or determine what the conversion rate, you know, from one stage to the next is. And I guess you can you could sort of with that, you might be able to spot where the issues are. If we're seeing like a low sales, we could look at each stage before the sales stage, and you know, sort of see where the problem was, and you know, and focus our energies there when we look to improve it or see why it's uh, going down. Absolutely. And there's really like the scorecard is just a diagnostic tool, right? It helps you. The idea is that it helps you have, you helps you take appropriate action. And from a people perspective, 
it, it's the starting point for an effective people development discussion. You're not going to look at the scorecard and know, oh, this I can see that this rep has a problem with listening. <laughs> if you're if you're trying to make your scorecard that tight, then it's, you probably have too many metrics on it, and you're um, you're trying to let your scorecard tell you too much when mm -hmm. it's really the starting point for a coaching discussion. So as you mm -hmm. look at those metrics, you know, proposals one demo, or maybe even like a qualify metric. Qualify metrics, you might want to, you know, you might want those to come down so that your 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 reps are qualifying the only the right clients into that mm -hmm. uh right into their into their process, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, no, it definitely been in, in organizations that had a sales team that 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 you know just had horribly low close rates because they had to do so much time and energy in qualifying and they were just, you know, slogging through so many unqualified uh, leads that, uh, that yeah, to get much fewer leads would have been better rather than worse. Yep. And generating, generating proposals that were never going to close. That's, yeah. a, that's a waste of time. Yeah. Um, on your website on the blog, you, you talk about how there are three areas to consider to go a little more in depth into what you were just saying. There are three areas to consider when improving metrics, people, message, and processes. Uh, I wonder if you could kind of give us a little explanation of what those three things are and like, you know, maybe some examples of what it looks like to uh, improve uh, or, or to utilize your scorecard when it comes to people, message, and process. All right. Absolutely. Love to talk about that. Uh, people, process, and message are part of our managed growth system. The managed growth system is about this fundamental is about building building the growth assets, and those growth assets are people, message, and systems. From a messaging perspective, um, you know we feel as though the ideal clients are the center of everything. So you need to have ideal clients with outcome centric personas that are documented. The ideal client journey with what personas? Is, um, outcome centric persona. So if you think about like, especially in B2B, you don't necessarily need to know, um, the level of demographic, um, like in a B2C environment, if you're targeting a teenager and you want to know, um, you know, what, what periodicals they read and you need, you need a very granular level of detail for a B2C, um, persona, but on the B2B, you know, you need enough information to be able to engage with the, you know, the 5.4, um, folks that are involved in a B2B decision. And it's really important to understand the the outcomes. Oh, I say, let's just back want. up for a second here. I and I, I appreciate you using the term outcome-based persona because I was not very I was not really familiar with that term. And I appreciate, you know, what do you mean mm -hmm. outcome-based and what do you mean 5.4? So we work work with B2B services organizations and typically, you know, there's many, you know, four to six decision makers that affect a B2B services decision. So if you look at a finance person, a CFO, and a um, you know an, an IT, a CIO, you think the out, what are the outcomes that these different people want from the business? Um, well, actually, what are the outcomes that they want from their day to day? Because the idea is that you need to align your message and align how you deliver services, quite frankly, around the outcomes that those different personas want from the business. Is that is that a little clear, Ben? Sorry, I may have a uh, yeah. I think that. so. No, I you know I just don't have the knowledge on uh, on, on sales as much to recognize the five point four reference. I see the average of decision makers in a in a deal, and and I see what you're saying about outcome based. So sorry for that uh, yep. little detour there, but uh, yeah, people message and process. No worries. Um, so the ideal client journey slash proven process for those of you that are running on EOS is is the shows your. Ideal clients, the journey they can expect from your team and your team, the experience that they're supposed to deliver. That serves as a framework for the message. Um, and from a systems perspective, you've got documented playbooks. Our playbooks start with the perspective of your ideal client, but you need to have those, your processes, sales, marketing, operational processes in place to drive that experience for your clients. You have a scorecard. It's part of the system as well that tracks your how you're doing on serving and getting more ideal clients, and then your technology or CRM is aligned around those systems as well. Your team has full visibility there um, to, to your ideal clients in your CRM. Lastly, on the people side, Ben, it's about having the right leaders in place to enable your sales and marketing teams and operational, for that matter, to succeed. And then from an execution perspective, you have the right marketing people or partners in place and the right sales folks in place to implement the plan as well. And that your entire client facing team is aligned to their role in delivering a great 
client journey or proven process in the EOS terms. Right. Well, I mean, so 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 let, let me let me ask you if we can get a little more concrete into 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 painting a picture for what some of these things look like. Uh, I guess if you don't mind sharing any examples or stories of where, you know, either whether with your company or for your clients' companies or whatever, um, you know, how you've approached maturing people's metrics or, you know, getting to appropriate metrics, uh, you know, and how you, you know, did that, I guess, in terms of the messaging, in terms of the people, or in terms of the process, or if you can give a story from all three, but just I would love to hear some stories and war stories or real life stories. <laughs> From uh, from some of these examples stories? that I think would be, I think it would help people sort of get a com more concrete picture of how they can mature their own metrics by you know seeing themselves in some of these uh, some of these hopefully victories or at least positive journeys. Absolutely, for sure. So as I mentioned, that proven process or ideal client journey is really for a services organization. Services are not tangible. Like the I, our I, our proven process at Convergo is we call the ideal client journey. So this is the most tangible thing that a services organization can communicate to their clients about how they're going to realize value with their business. And it also is the framework for aligning the team um, as well. So we talked with an IT services company last month that has some really aggressive growth goals. Um, the the founder, you know, um, a year or so ago hit a ceiling. He had some sales reps. Um, without really having structure or a plan. Um, and the sales reps, they're still doing well, but still doing really kind of well. A lot of it's because of the founder, uh, but mm -hmm. they're not generating the results that they need on the sales team. Um, and they're bringing in business since they're not, they're not like aligned around an ideal client or, or the process. They're bringing in sometimes not the right business, um, which is a burden on their operational team. And like you see in many organizations, sales and operations, is there, there's a lot of friction there. Um, so, you know, before we systematize, you know, build up, like, look at implementing sales processes, the first step is to make sure the whole business is aligned around ideal clients and the ideal client journey at Convergo or proven process. So we have, a, we help them, uh, we are going to help them. And this is a pretty common, um, common scenario. The first step is that ideal client journey alignment workshop or proven process alignment workshop. And you align all the leadership around ideal clients and that, their proven process. And then, you know, once that, that framework and that alignment is there, then you can uh, you develop a plan to get the reps pointed in the right direction, make sure operations is creating their own processes to drive that, that ideal client journey. So that's an example. That's one example, Ben, about uh, that's a, the message, right? They're uh, they right. aligning the business or the message. Right. What about on uh, either, I guess, people or process, thinking about that? Sure. sure. For um, Let's see. For people, you can share a story of a commercial landscaping company. They are at about 7.5 million, have 35.5% growth goals. Uh, we helped develop a revenue growth plan with a line around, that group, around their ideal clients. Um, and we have a good plan to build the systems and message. But um, before we did that, um, there's a more pressing need. They um they needed someone, they had promoted their sales leader, sales and marketing leader to integrator, leaving that vacancy, leaving a vacancy in that seat. Right. So um, you know, we wanted to hot we they wanted to act pretty quickly on that to make sure that the integrator could focus on his new role as integrator. So we're sitting in that seat fractionally to fill that mm -hmm. gap immediately right. where we'll manage the reps. Um, uh, and our, um, one of our growth guides, which is our fractional leaders is sitting, you know, they'll, she sits on the leadership level 10 meeting and, um, and then manages the reps has one-on-ones manages the sales, um, the sales level tens as well. And as we already have the plan is now, as we get more integrated into the business, we'll help build the systems, hone the message, grow, and then find a replacement for, for uh, for our growth guide in there, Deb. All right. Awesome. Yeah. No, I mean, you can definitely see how, you know, how having a fractional executive, you know, whether in your case, it's uh, in your case, it's sales, uh, sales leadership uh, or other kinds of fractional executives can, can get, uh, I guess, fill in the gap if, if having the right people, especially at the management level, uh, because I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've seen it happen. I know it's very common in sales that the, the best sales guy or best sales gal uh, gets promoted to the sales manager or sales leader. And, you know, they may be a great individual contributor, 
uh, but not great in terms of managing uh, the sales team. I don't know if you have any stories like that, but that's uh, that that's a perennial that's challenge. True. The best sales reps are the worst sales managers, and almost vice versa, right? They're really, and that's a very common thing to do, um, to because you're you're used to doing that in other parts of the business where you have a an operations leader to you know move up up in the business or an operations, you know, like a lower level operations person can easily move up to be an operations leader typically. In the sales space though, first of all, it makes no sense to move the your most, your highest producing salesperson that's generating right. the most revenue for your business into a leadership role because not only are they not a good leader, more than likely you just lost your highest producing sales rep. So yeah. And that we see that a lot. Yeah. But, you know, it, it brings up, though, an interesting sort of a catch 22 that, you know, if you're going to if you're going to sell a product or service, if you if you're going to also that means sell. So you need knowledge and expertise on the product or service and you need expertise in selling that product or service, yep. which is an, another piece of knowledge or set of aspects of knowledge. And. uh and so it's important that somebody do does have, you know, uh, actual expertise at the activities for which the people they're going to be managing uh, are are responsible. And so, I guess, how do you approach in the organizations that you are advising? How do you approach? Because you probably, you know, I guess if you don't pick the highest salesperson, you got to pick somebody who does have good leadership and management skills, or is showing likelihood of having leadership and management skills. But, you know, at the same time, you know, maybe they're not the highest grossing salesperson, but I don't know. Like, how do you, how do you approach that? How do you approach that? I don't know if it's a chicken and egg or it's just a catch 22 problem is that the skills for which you're successful as a salesperson are just different than the, than the skills of being a leader and a manager, but you also have to know something or at least be respected by the people who you're managing and for the skill that for what you're managing them for. How do you approach that? Yeah. So for a sales leader, and we do see you know, there's a lot of sales leaders out there. They get they get sales enough, but they're more of a um, you know it's a different skill set to be a people, you know to to develop people. Some people naturally do that, like a sales a natural sales manager, um, yeah, has the skill to be able to you know I, I guess one of the temptations for a selling a selling centric sales manager, let's say Ben, is to actually go out and sell. You know to to Take deals. Right. Close the deal. You bring it up there, I'll close it. Exactly. That <laughs> sounds good for like ringing the bell when you get back in the office. But in reality, if you do that, you're not developing your sales reps. And the best sales managers are more focused on, you know, they might lose that deal in the short term in the interest of developing their reps so that you win more a lot in the future. Um, the interesting thing, though, Ben, for organizations that do, if you take that superstar salesperson, make them the sales manager, they can be developed. Um, you know, we use the grow coaching framework, which is a very learnable framework to help, you know, uh, someone that's not as a natural, you know, sales leader or operational leader for that matter, to learn the skills to be able to have more effective discussions with the folks that work for them and that grow you. So it can be developed, but, you know, coming in as you start, it's probably, you know, ideal to do some aptitude testing and find out the sales manager that is more of a natural instead of trying to take a revenue producing sales rep and develop him or her. Mm -hmm. And when you say find someone who has aptitude in it, are we just like looking at the top 50% of salespeople and see who among them maybe, or like, how do you approach that if it's not the top producer? I mean, so you can take, I mean, there's uh, I mean, if you put an ad out for a sales leader, or you mean just hire uh, from I mean, the outside, you mean? Or outside or inside. I mean, you could do an aptitude test and understand if that someone has that is a if they're a natural seller. And there's a lot of different assessment products out there that mm -hmm. help people understand what they're natural, you know, what they're naturally good at. Um, but you know, if you can hire internally, absolutely. I mean, that's that's absolutely preferred. But regardless of in, external or internal, you know, you want to make sure that you're that you've got the right person going into that position because typically, you know, that superstar sales rep. You know, it, you can develop them, but they're going to do more than likely what I just said. They're going to be a lot of times selling for their reps and winning some stuff in the short term right. and sacrificing the long term benefits of developing a sales team. 
Right. I hear that. Uh, is there anything else that you, I guess, or how would you wrap this up or what would you leave us with? I guess when we comes back to this topic of, uh, of maturing your metrics, uh, developing it beyond that, you know, maybe more backward looking, uh, you know, more lagging uh, qualities to get more, you know, to, to better metrics in terms of people process uh, message. I guess what, what would you leave us with when it comes to maturing your metrics? Well, the thing is that they all do work together, the people, the systems and the message. Um, and, you know, when you do have that, when you are, when you've turned those dials, when you have that mature scorecard and you're tracking the right metrics, you know, let's say your scorecard is an eight out of 10, right? You get to a nine out of 10 by, you know, those are the big dials, the people, the systems and uh, the, uh, the message what it looks like when you're tracking the right metrics, then it becomes pretty easy to understand what dials you might need to turn mm -hmm. in order to carry the message forward and watch the metrics move from, from left to right. So just be comfortable with the fact that it's a journey and you're not, it's not perfect at first, but it's absolutely a journey worth taking. Uh, you can't, you know, ensure, be flexible. Don't, 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 um, you know, a, a lot of folks are apprehensive to change their scorecard metrics in the middle of the year. You know, if that's not working, then, you know, look at the systems and look at the people and look at the message and be flexible with, uh, be willing to make adjustments to your metrics to get to that nine and 10 out of a 10, to, or nine or 9.5 out of 10, since I said there was no such thing as a perfect scorecard. <laughs> so be patient and um, consider all that as you, as you go through your scorecard journey. All right. Awesome. I right, look, Bill, I truly appreciate this. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on, sharing this stuff. And, uh, you know, hope people can, uh, can, can get their metrics to be more mature and, and obviously they can learn more about you and everything that you're teaching and your team is doing at uh, convergo.co and, uh, and truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And everybody else will see you on the other side. Thanks. You're listening to win, 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 win. an entrepreneurial community with your host, Ben Wolf.